I thank the organizer for giving me the chair position of this session. Uh, we'll be listening uh, Alexander Lefebvre from University of Sydney, Australia, uh, talking about uh, Bergson and liberalism. And uh, on the second position, we will have uh, Larry S. McCray in, uh, from USA, USA, Bergson's view on colonialism, education and empire in North Africa after the French Third Republic. If Alexandre Lefebvre is ready, I can give the floor to, to him, please. Sure, with pleasure. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, good, good, mo good morning, good afternoon, good, good wherever you are. Uh, just to start, I want to, of course, thank the organizers, Len, Katerina, and Ted for putting this together, but just for keeping a great community afloat in tough times. So thanks so much. And I know we're all kind of zoomed out by now, I expect, but something really nice that this uh, medium can, can, uh, can afford. So it's great to see everyone here. Um, by way of apology, uh, so the, <laughs> all the other sessions, except for the one that we have right now, are in the dead of like, I'm talking dead of night, like 3 AM in the morning for Sydney. So I'm afraid, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be there. But I'm told that they're going to be recorded. So I think Melanie and I were talking about a date night together to, to watch some, to do some Bergsonian catch up. So we're going to. We're going to do that uh, and watch the sessions together. All right, so the title of my paper is Bergson and Liberalism. So for many years now, I've been working on Bergson and political theory, um, in part sometimes to explain what I think Bergson was up to in his moral and political thought, uh, but also and really for me trying to take ideas from Bergson and apply them to, um, to different kinds of problems in contemporary political theory. So my first book was on, um, I took a concept of judgment from matter and memory and uh, it's, it's, its ideas of memory and perception and uh, worked it towards a concept of education and legal judgment. My last couple of books have been working with Bergson's um, fascinating idea of love in two sources and trying to develop theories of human rights from it. So just by way of remark, I want to say a few words about what I'm working on right now to situate why uh, I'm going to talk about Bergson and liberalism in the first place. And um, I don't know if this is breaking with precedent, but I'm actually going to do a couple slides if that's okay. Um, uh, and we'll um, go from there. So Emil, is that up for you? Can you see that? Yes, it is. Perfect. Um, So the new book I'm working on right now is titled uh, Liberalism as a Way of Life, and I'm sort of in the middle of getting it done, and uh, it's hopefully maybe going to come out in a couple of years. Um, and so the project that I'm working on, it's not directly Bergsonian, but it does take some kind of inspiration from him. So my basic idea is in the book that I'm working on is that a whole lot of us today, um, myself very much included, and I imagine a lot of people on this Zoom call um, are liberals in a deep sense. And by that, I mean, not only are our political ideas and uh, like our, our citizenly life oriented by liberal ideas and principles, but I think that a lot of us are liberals kind of all the way down or in a very deep sense where the ideas and sensibilities and practices of liberalism have started to make up just how we orient ourselves in day-to-day -day life and inform like what we think of friendship, marriage, um, what we think is funny, outrageous, uh, meaningful, normal, and all the rest. And so I won't go into the details, I'm happy to if you like, but the argument I want to make in the book is that liberalism uh, can be a fully fledged way of life and one that I think is personally and spiritually rewarding to boot. So it's like a good way of life. So like I said, I'm not working this out too, too much with respect to Bergson. My main thinker in this text is actually going to be uh, Rawls, John Rawls. I know when I say that to a crowd like this, I lose a lot of my street cred uh, turning to Rawls, but I, I am who I am. And um, so what I'm trying to do is read some of these major concepts in that book, uh, like the original position and public reason as spiritual exercises or as, um, as techniques that are formative of the self. But in the book, I'm also very much inspired by a big long tradition of liberalism that, um, that happens in 19th century France which is where liberalism really is born. And so what I wanna do in this paper is overview that conception of liberalism and see where Bergson sits with respect to it. 
Because while Bergson, to my knowledge at least, and I'd be thrilled to be corrected, um, doesn't explicitly engage with liberalism as an ethical or political tradition, I think it can be so, I mean, so much of two sources, I think in particular, is happens at a tacit level. And there's all these systematic yet totally implicit conversations going on in that text. And I suspect that Bergson's engagement with a liberal tradition, both in ethics and in politics, is also happening between the lines or as a kind of subtext in that. So I want to try to raise it up a little bit and see what we can make of that. And not just, not just as a project of kind of textual reconstruction, but because I think that Bergson can speak meaningfully to liberal political thought today and to us and to reinvigorate it in um, important ways. So I want to try to lay those out in a general sense. So that's the game plan. So what I've said must surely sound a little bit abstract and general. Um, so let me just set out a framework for what I'm talking about. So in the in the West, so-called Western world, liberalism has been the dominant social and political ideology now for the past 200 years. Um, we know, as, and as we know very well, uh, it's been undergoing uh, something of a rough spot in the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Now I heard just as I was, uh, just as I joined the Zoom call, I was hearing some, some look, we got to take good moments when they come. I was hearing some talks of champagne and mimosas for the, <laughs> for the recent turn in world events. That's cool. And, and you got to take your wins when you can. But listen, if it hadn't been for the pandemic, tr Trump would have walked this thing in. I mean, let's not, <laughs> let's not get too high on our horses just right away. I mean, the, the challenge of liberalism is still uh, very much ongoing. But you know, a silver lining, uh, so tough times, but a silver lining in all of this turbulence is, <laughs> at least in the small corner of intellectual history, there's been a number of tremendous books on uh, the history of liberalism as a, as a, as a political uh, and philosophical idea in the past few years, and books I've really learned a lot from. So just to flag two that have particularly been important to me, um, Helena Rosenblatt's The Lost History of Liberalism, published by uh, Princeton two years ago, and then um, Annalene Dejean's Freedom, published by Harvard, uh, like just a couple months ago, both of which are excellent texts. And so what I really admire about these books is that they shake up our received ideas of liberalism, particularly uh, our ideas for those people living in Anglo-American countries. Why? Because what I mean today is that there's really, I think, a settled or received understanding of what liberalism is, and it's primarily as a rights-based doctrine. And the general kind of assumption of what that political philosophy does is it's concerned with the protection of individual rights and interests. And in particular, if we um, look at uh, Anglophone liberal political philosophy, it's really captured by a certain picture of what liberalism is and does. And so just in my simple way, I drew it. Um, just bear with me. I won't, I won't belabor this. But the idea is that liberalism provides something of a framework for different kinds of people or people with different conceptions of the good to be able to um, to live and flourish together in a pluralist society. So on the bottom here in my little stick, stick figures, you have co different comprehensive doc conceptions of the good, whether they're religious or secular. And all of these are mediated and made convivial as it were by this thing called the liberal political conceptions, which includes things like basic rights and charters, but also fundamental political values that don't uh, skew towards any particular one of these conceptions of the good, but s stand independently of them as again, this kind of neutral framework for them. So that's sort of, I, in my understanding of the kind of post late Rawls political liberal tradition in Anglophone countries, this is something like the scheme that everyone is working on. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't want to problem, I don't think this is problematic per se or, or wrong or anything like that. Um, but I don't think, first of all, it captures how liberalism is lived by a great number of people today. But more narrowly, and where I want to begin is I don't think it's representative of how what liberalism was historically and how it really emerged in the 19th century through its most famous figures. So thinkers, for example, like um, Benjamin Constant, Madame de Stahl, Alexis de Tocqueville, J.S. Mill, none of these would recognize this picture exactly as the framework they were trying, as the, as the doctrine they were trying to set up. So here, let me just return for a moment to this text by Helena Rosenblatt that gives us, I think, some very interesting and important coordinates to approach Bergson with. So I know that, no, I mean, likely you haven't read this text, but uh, let me just, I'll be very, very simple here. 
And Rosenblatt's book begins with the very sensible intuition that when we talk about liberalism, no one really has any clue what they're talking about. There are so many different strains of it, so many different traditions. There's classical liberalism, social democracy, neoliberalism, then you got all the national um, uh, traditions. And so what she does is she starts by saying, okay, let's just trace out the use of the word liberal in, um, in, in kind of the history of philosophy and see where that takes us. And it's a very fascinating project because the history of the word liberal is very, very old indeed. So it starts in, it's a, it's a Roman, it's a Latin word and is prominent in the Roman, uh, in Roman political thought. And so liber means an individual who is free and generous and liberalis means befitting a free born person. And so in English, we still very much preserve this idea of what it means to be liberal. So just to cite the OED, uh, liberal today means free and giving, generous, benevolent, magnanimous, uh, suitable for a free or noble person. So, in ancient, so the, 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 the word has just this very interesting genealogy and trajectory that's at once changes all the time, but is, is a, a remarkably continuous too. So in ancient times, being liberal meant uh, an aristocratic attitude and one that was essential to the cohesion and functioning of a free society. In particular, it meant someone who was ready to give their talent, their wealth, and even their life um, for the city or for the republic. In the Middle Ages, the word liberal gets reinvented continually with Christianity, as you would expect, and is overladen with uh, Christian values, in particular charity. So in the King James Bible, the word liberal is used all the time, I think 15 times in total, always in connection with the poor. And then in the early modern period, liberalism just, li the word liberal just booms again. And uh, in particular in the United States, you have this idea that being liberal means contributing to the public good and uh, ensuring the viability of the, the colony. So, um, that was, oh, sorry. Anyways, the, uh, sorry, I was meant to put up a short quote here, but Rosenblatt's point is by the mid 17th century, Europeans had been calling liberality a necessary virtue for 2000 years. So if ever we wanna trace out a tradition of what that means, there's a good place to look. So that's how uh, she sets up her book. And there's two important points I just wanna take home for us today. Point one. First, when liberalism was invented in the 19th century, and in particular 19th century France, Constant, Madame de Stael, uh, Tocqueville, Guizot, a whole bunch of thinkers, it was first and foremost an ethical doctrine. It was only secondarily a political or even a constitutional question. And the big question that it pursued was like, uh, the liberal problem was the following. How is it possible for people living under modern conditions Besieged as, we all by, besieged as we are by all kinds of political, economic, and spiritual pressures, how is it possible to enjoy a whole and integrated life? Or in other words, how can liberality and a liberal character be cultivated in the modern world? And if we look at the 19th century canon, we can just point to basically any prominent liberal thinker and see that that was the big problem orienting them. So like Tuckville, for example, he's obsessed with all the dangers that democracy is throwing up in part like individualism, like materialism, in part because that's going to destabilize the polity, but also because it attacks our soul at the most meaningful level. Like we become these nasty, vicious, unhappy, unsettled, egoistic little subjects. And that's not okay. And he's trying to reinvent ways for people to become liberal once more in their hearts. Uh, to be free, open-minded, generous, and all of that. So that's the first big message. Liberalism is ethical doctrine at this time, not primarily a political one. Second, um, the second big message of Rosenblatt's book that I want to pull out is that 19th century liberals were obsessed with the question of education. In particular, how to ensure that the masses in democratic countries um, could be uh, cultivated as liberal subjects, and in particular, not false, not be seduced by socialism on the one hand, or worse, some sort of aristocratic royalist uh, restoration on the other hand. So it was really a project about uh, moral and character characterological education um, for a whole century of thought. So I have a quote here, I'm not gonna read it, but basically anytime something went wrong for a liberal in the 19th century, the answer was educate the masses better. It was never structural reform or attend to poverty or whatever, it was educate the masses as to what their genuine interest is. Okay, I know that's a lot of preamble, but let me turn to Bergson for real now. So I want to propose uh, two ways in which uh, Bergson is cutting into this, these liberal 
debates and thoughts in particular in the two sources of morality and religion. Because I think it's, again, an entirely tacit, but an entirely systematic engagement. And so first point I want to make or suggest, um, this is very preliminary, so um, it's, it's very open-ended, let's say. So first point I want to suggest is one, that the open soul from uh, the two sources can be read as a call for a genuinely liberal soul, someone who is generous, tolerant, and free. And I think that Bergson is taking on the qualities of the liberal soul and giving them an emphatic reinterpretation in the two sources. Second, um, and this is the polemical and critical aspect, especially of the first part, a main obstacle to bringing about a liberal soul for Bergson are fellow liberals, in particular, the kind of moral and civic education proposed by Bergson's main interlocutor in two sources, which is Emil Durkheim. So let me start with point number two, and we're going to work back to point number one. So a claim I've tried to make, and with Melanie in many publications as well, uh, is that Bergson's thought in two sources develops in extraordinary extent uh, in relation to an engagement with Durkheim. And that can be seen, uh, that's difficult to see because it's altogether uh, implicit. But if you look at especially the first um, big chapter of Two Sources Moral Obligation, you just see it's replete with Durkheimian terms and Bergson is one by one presenting them and undermining them systematically over and over again. Um, and I don't have time to overview the different facets of that criticism, but allow me to identify one line of criticism that Bergson makes of Durkheim. And it concerns the concept of moral education that Durkheim puts forward in his book, uh, L'Education Morale, Moral Education, which was published in 1922, but was in fact given as lectures at the Sorbonne in 1902 and 1903. Um, Durkheim was, by the way, chair at Salban of Education and Sociology. That was his position. And so it's, it's fundamental to how he developed his own social theory. So to give the very briefest summary of the argument of Durkheim's argument is that in moral education, he puts forward a theory about how individuals are socialized into different and complementary social groups. And he views these groups in terms of stages, starting from little ones like the family, working up towards bigger units like the parish, like the nation especially, and then finally culminating in this, um, in the group of humanity as a whole, which is when we become truly moral uh, individuals. And so the basic idea is that each of these different stages from little to medium to big, Individuals learn how to detach themselves from their own narrow interests. In particular, they learn to overcome egoism and ultimately become moral beings who recognize their duties to various groups and also admit and acknowledge the identity that they owe to those groups. So here is a quote from uh, Durkheim that is absolutely fundamental to how Bergson develops the critical project of two sources and builds off that towards the positive sections. Um, so I'll just read it out. Family, nation, and human, says Durkheim, represent different phases of our social and moral evolution, stages that have mutually prepared one another. Consequently, these groups can be superimposed on one another without mutual exclusion. Just as each has its part to play in historical development, they mutually complement each other in the present. Each has its function. The family envelops the person in an altogether different way and answers to different moral needs than does the nation. It is not a matter then of making an exclusive choice among them. Man is not morally complete unless he undergoes this triple action. And so it's very easy to diagram this idea. So what you have is Durkheim as concentric circles. So we start our moral life in the, in the bosom of the family, and then slowly and slowly we, uh, ra we, we are socialized into bigger groups and our moral sensibility and, and duties um, enlarge and appropriately. And so we can pull a whole set of uh, conclusions from this idea of moral development. And let me just lay out three and I'll present Bergson's responses to them one by one in a moment. So first of all, love, this is again, this is Durkheim, I'm just fleshing out Durkheim here. Love and duty for the family, number one, uh, nation and humanity are compatible. There's no tragic choice between them. Each has its own quality, but there is no necessary antagonism between them. There's, a, there's an important continuity, which is two, love and duty can extend to larger and larger groups of people all the way to the whole of humanity. And three, liberal individuals for Durkheim, namely individuals, citizens too, that would have the qualities associated with liberality, 
for example, generosity, open-minded, civic engagement, and tolerance. Well, those kinds of individuals, they're not born. They're not born, they're made. And they're made by advancing through these different groups, uh, one by one successively, and then culminating in the way they all three click together. Give me terrible Zoom etiquette. My, uh, my email was on. Um, so I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that all of Bergson's moral and political philosophy is aimed at this particular conception of moral education. Now, for the sake of time, I have to presume, um, and I think I can given the, the distinguished audience, um, that we're all pretty familiar with the criticisms that he's going to make of this idea and which stem from Bergson's naturalist or biological conception of morality and society. So in a nutshell, the 32nd version is that Bergson says that morality and everything that goes with it, like obligation, sympathy, reciprocity, well, all of that is a product of evolution. And the first 30 pages of two sources make that argument. But right away at the very beginning of that text, Bergson makes a crucial move because he says, if morality is in essence biological, that is, if we instinctively care and feel about our fellows, it means for Bergson that morality has sharp natural limits. He doesn't mince his words at all. Man is indeed, like political philosophy always said, a wolf to man, but in the best sense, not of being kind of vicious to one another, but hanging together through thick and thin in structures of reciprocity and, um, and, and love and mutual obligation. Here are, here are the real wolves. It's not the lone wolf, it's the group wolf. So here's Bergson very early, and there's a million statements to this effect, but who can help seeing that social cohesion is largely due to the necessity of a community to protect itself against the others? against others, excuse me, and that is primarily as against all other men that we love the men with whom we live. Such is the primitive instinct. So the critical point is this, right? If the biological function of morality is to ensure the cohesion and solidarity of groups, and hence to help the individual survive, pass along the genetics, not be selected out, well, it means that the scope of moral obligation does not extend further than the group, however large that group may be. Or to use Bergson's emphatic word, such societies are always uh, in, inevitably closed. They ex include certain people and they exclude certain people. So on the left side here, I had my Durkheimian conclusions that I had pulled from the, the expanding circle diagram. But here's just the, the very pithy Bergsonian replies that he would make to Durkheim and out of which he'll develop his own positive project. So the idea, first of all, that love uh, and duty for family, nation, and humanity are compatible. Bergson just say, no way. So sure, as I write here, love and duty for family and nation can, if properly managed, become compatible. But they cannot extend to humanity as a whole because morality has evolved in four groups. There's a certain limit. It can be as big as a group of nations, but it's not going to get bigger. Two, the idea that, uh, yeah, two is just a repetition of one. Third is very interesting. So third... Uh, the idea was is that liberal individuals for Durkheim are made through this process of socialization into the different groups. Bergson's answer is very interesting, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing and working it out, but this is what I take he would say. Namely, that Durkheim's moral education makes liberal individuals within groups. So to your, family fam, fa, uh, to your fellow family members, to your countrymen. But that very same moral education also makes subjects illiberal which is to say closed off, uncharitable, potentially hostile, and certainly hypocritical to those outside the group. So for reasons of time, I can't expand uh, this criticism any further, but to transition to the final aspect of my presentation, I can point out a key assumption shared by both authors. So Bergson's gonna repudiate Durkheim's particular conception of moral education. Sure, but Bergson is absolutely gonna double down on the idea that the right kind of moral education will produce properly liberal subjects who are open, generous, and tolerant. In other words, education becomes both thinkers' answer to the problem of their times. That's very much in the liberal trajectory. <clears throat> and so just to recall uh, Rosenblatt's two ideas about 19th century liberalism, one is that it concentrates on ethical subjects, two, it's about education. Bergson carries on both those ambitions to the letter. Now, to adequately discuss how he fleshes that out is far too great a task in the five less minutes that remain me. 
Um, because what we would need to do to expand Bergson's vision of the, of the liberal subject is discuss what Bergson means by the open society and dynamic religion, as these are inspired by an emotion that he calls love. For the only subject on Bergson's account that is worthy of the name liberal and liberality is one who has learned how to love in a way that does not exclude other people and one who knows what it means to feel fellowship in a way that's not bound up with hatred for other people. Or if I can use, I mean, I'm in the, I'm in the right crowd for this. I can use a Bergsonian shorthand that would make any liberal political philosophy philosopher either laugh or cry, but the uptake is that for Bergson, the only way to be liberal is through mysticism. And the way in which such a liberalism and a liberal soul will be taught, will be educated, if you like, is through those doctrines and institutions that have themselves been created and sustained by the emotion of love. So whether that's through world religions, for example, or whether that's through the kind of stuff I've tried to work through in my previous work on human rights, we become initiated into a world of love through these kinds of, um, of institutions imbued and created by the force of love. Okay, so to conclude then, let me wrap up in two minutes. I'd like to raise two points about, uh, two, two more general points. One's about Bergson and what makes him a special kind of liberal in his own context. And second, uh, why Bergson might be important for us to read today, if not us, I mean, obviously we, we take its value for granted, but why political philosophy might be interested in his thought. So first of all, what makes Bergson special in his time is that he's a pro-democracy liberal. In his own French tradition, but also in the German tradition, pretty much in the, in the British tradition as well, that is very much against the grain because the great liberal thinkers who preceded him like Constant, like Tocqueville, well, all of them are deeply ambivalent about democracy and they formulate liberalism for, uh, as a response to democracy, as a way to contain and to train its excesses. But for Bergson, uh, Bergson doesn't have those reservations about democracy, it seems to me, in, uh, in his political thought. Of course, I mean, like, like any observer, he knows democracy can go awry, it can backslide. Um, hold on, I don't actually need this anymore. Um, so Bergson was, uh, Bergson didn't have the reservations about democracy. Of course, it can backslide into all kinds of different other regimes. And of course, it can be alloyed with the clothes. Sure, that, but that's just any, any political ideology is susceptible to those fates. But for Bergson, there's nothing in principle that determines democracy in those directions. Um, and in particular, he's going to see democracy as the highest political expression of fraternity. So there's these three very tight pages and two sources on democracy and how in particular it reconciles the, 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 the tension between liberty and equality through this idea of a fraternity. And he calls democracy evangelical in essence. There's no higher praise for Bergson than that. Um, so for Bergson, becoming properly liberal and becoming properly democratic, um, both in terms of regime, but also in terms of one's own self is the same project. They're not in tension with one another. And that puts him in a very special intellectual trajectory one much more aligned with American thought, like the uh, pragmatists like Dewey or transcendentalists like Emerson, um, but that's going to be deeply out of step with his own media, but also deeply out of step with what liberalism will become, say, in America post-war with Hayek and the rise of liberalism as a protection of individual rights and property against democratic socialist excesses. So anyway, so Demo uh, Bergson's this kind of untimely figure in that respect. Second question, as to why contemporary liberals might want to read him. Well, let me put my cards on the table. As I said earlier, we all know that today, liberal institutions and values are under attack worldwide. Now, its defenders are fighting, I mean, hooray for this week, but its defenders are fighting back, of course. Um, but I think that they and that we could be doing a much better, better job to promote the creed. On the one hand, the global conversation on the crisis of liberalism tends to fixate on its opponents and how awful and nasty and stupid populism, nativism, and authoritarianism are. And only rarely are the strengths and virtues of liberalism themselves emphasized. And when those strengths and when liberalism is actually positively defended, the root of that defense or justification is almost always institutional. Like, hey, look, don't we need the doctrine of division of powers, judicial neutrality, individual rights? Um, all of that's under attack. Now, I think that's absolutely crucial. Like, <laughs> far be it for me to uh, downplay the importance of those, uh, of those institutions. But what I think it misses is a whole 
robust, let's say, sentimentalist or spiritualist or existential defense of liberalism, that these ideas are fundamental to who we are, how we live our lives, not just in our citizenly identities, but in our, in our just comportment and way of life more generally. And so that's why I think Bergson is such an indispensable thinker, because he shows just how deeply something like liberalism is connected to what he calls love. And so what, how it's connected to tolerance, to openness and true liberality. And so Bergson then is going to highlight this whole other spectrum of reasons as to why we should care about the fate of liberalism, both politically, individually, and existentially. So he's a wonderful ally, I think, to help us reconnect with the resources of the liberal tradition and help us recover, understanding, understand, and embrace its core values, both for the sake of our countries, our world, and ultimately, I think, ourselves as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now we are moving to Larry, and after the two presentations, we have our usual discussion, debate, and comment. So, Larry, you can open. You can just open your mic and then take the floor. You have hey, the floor. Thank please. you. Thank you for that introduction, Emil. Thank you, Alex, for a great talk. I am going to share with you my screen. And voila. Um, I'm talking to you from New York City, where I'm in a pretty good mood right now. There is a um, spontaneous jubilation in the streets, and I'd like to think that Bergson would approve. Uh, we aren't going to be talking about that side of his politics in this talk. I'm going to be talking about his views on colonialism. So I'm going to ground this in a uh, specific textual moment. In the 1923 review of the book, Morocco, School of Energy, Bergson praised a new philosophy of colonialism. According to the book's author, Muslim energy was short and shining, powerless to rule over things. It's just another face of indolence, as anger is just another face of weakness. I want to share with you at length what Bergson has to say about uh, France's colonial ambitions in North Africa in that. Muslim indolence is by no means a refusal to work. It consists fundamentally in a radical indifference to change. The native does not believe that life can change. He therefore does not consider a sustained effort necessary. His energy is brief, only intended to meet the needs of the moment. European civilization, on the contrary, implies a belief in the effectiveness of effort. This contrast gives us the key to the problem of colonization. We have to start from there to understand what we came to do in Morocco. What we see less is the secret force which, since the War of 1870, namely the Franco-Prussian War in the Third Repu that ignited the Third Republic in France, has pushed us, that is the French, to colonize. A revolt of the stifled energies of our country, race, a need to act and to teach action. The colonies in general, Morocco in particular, returned to us, vivified the lifeblood that we lend to them. The phrase that, which he's referring to the author, uh, Alfred Detard, gives us the dominant idea of his book. And he concludes by saying, here you have the first chapter in a philosophy of colonization. So most of us read this and we like Bergson normally and we read this and we go, ew, I don't like that. So what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with this interesting historical uh, anecdote in Bergson's career? And what's more striking than just his uh, uncritical and uh, historically contextual attitude toward France's empire in North Africa was that he characterized the empire's civilizing mission in terms of energy, activity, life, deeply Bergsonian concepts. Now, this one review from 1923 was not the lone blemish on Bergson's corpus. His political thought has drawn criticism, especially in the era around World War I. Famously, Julian Benda, George Politzer, Paul Nietzsche mounted accusations of nationalistic chauvinism when Bergson rallied uh, the French against uh, the Germans. And more recently, um, scholars like Donna Jones, Ali al Sajib, Mark Sinclair, they've all presented Bergson's sometimes bellicose, often propagandistic proclivities when it came to politics. But how are we going to make sense in particular of Bergson's laudatory views of French colonialism? Uh, the author that I've encountered to actually pose the question this way was Mark Sinclair, 
a few years ago in an article in the Journal of History of Ideas, he writes that this gives rise to a question. What exactly is this doctrine of life as creation such that it can characterize now the production of artworks, now the process of psychological and biological life, now the French nation at war with Germany, and by extension, French colonialism as well. So I'm a, I'm a historian by training. I approach these questions uh, by going to the archives, marshalling evidence to understand uh, a few things. One is the institutions in which Bergson worked. Uh, the second is the resources on which he drew in order to develop his thought. And the third is the community of thinkers who posed problems and lent traction to Bergson's ideas. So I'm going to be uh, doing just that. Bergson was writing a review of um, Alfred de Tard's book, Morocco, The School of Energy. And Tard wrote that book by beginning with the question, what has France brought to the Maghreb that is new and fruitful? What does the native soul, what does the French soul itself gain from this contact? Now, Tard's goal was to understand the, the spiritual dimension of France's colonial conquests in North Africa. And according to Tard, there was a, um, an inseparable gulf between European industri industriousness and Muslim indolence. And these are quintessentially Orientalist um, distinctions between the Arab indolent desert and industrious Europe. Uh, the political historical context is also important because in 1912, France had taken Morocco as a protectorate um, from Spain following the, the Treaty of Fez. And so this was a new um, acquisition in the continuing scramble for Africa um, that was critical to the French empire in the Third Republic. Now, the name Tard might ring a bell uh, for some people. He was the um, nephew of Gabriel Tard. That was the, the sociologist who wrote um, The Laws of Imitation. And Gabriel Tard was, of course, very close with Henri Bergson. And the School of Energy, I want to suggest, this book that uh, the younger Tard wrote, was part of a wide ranging discourse in the human sciences at a time when embodied activity and the sciences of neurology and experimental and clinical psychology came to animate wide swaths of thought, not only sociology, as was the case for the elder Tard philosophy as well, but also um, politics and imperial management, I'm going to suggest. Now, Bergson's relationship to the elder Tard was quite close. Um, Tard took over the chair of modern philosophy at the Collège de France in 1900. We might remember that um, Bergson started his position at the Collège de France that year as a professor of ancient philosophy, and he then took over Tard's chair in 1903 to be a professor of modern um, philosophy. And this energetic approach to subjectivity was critical to uh, the elder Tard's laws of imitation, the idea that um, society was built very much against the Durkheimian strain that we just learned genetically from the ground up through psychic imitation, which was continuous um, with the energies that one found in the human realm of neurology and the life realm of physics, of physics that energy runs throughout these three dimensions, uh, matter, psychology, society, uh, was Tard's idea here. But let's get back to Bergson. Let's take seriously his idea that um, Alfred de Tard has offered a philosophy of colonialism. That philosophy being that North Africa is part of a school of energy. Um, what I'm gonna suggest is that we can make sense of this by understanding Bergson's thought as very much representative of an official doctrine of the French education system. Uh, we heard a lot about education in the last talk. I think it offered a great segue um, to this one. And I think that looking at the history of education um, is really important because in an era, and we're talking the long 19th century here and early 20th, um, before the television and the radio, which are modern conduits of ideology, education was the chief ideological mouthpiece of 
uh, the state. Louis Althusser used to call education the sharp edge of ideology. And that's why I think it's a fantastic institutional context in order to make sense of these issues. Now, my work previously has examined uh, Bergson as a public servant of the Third Republic carrying out the official um, education curriculum uh, of his country. And in my book, which just came out last month, Making Spirit Matter, here's a plug for you to please go out and uh, read it and buy it. Uh, my specific aim was to situate Bergson in Republican France to understand how his career as a lycée instructor, beginning here in 1881 when he was an agrégé from the École Normale Supérieure up to his uh, ascendance to the Collège de France was deeply influenced um, by, had a deep influence on his thought during the period. Uh, there were more generally, my aim in that book is to trace the long history of French spiritualism uh, from Mandy Beron up to the uh, 20th century and to argue that was always um, sustained by an ongoing conversation with uh, neurology and psychology. What I think is interesting about Bergson's career as a um, lycée instructor um, is, is not simply to reduce Bergson to his context, but explain the resources available to him. When he was a lycée instructor, the two textbooks that he used in his class uh, drew heavily on neurophysiology. And during this period, um, philosophy instructors, and it's critical to remember that philosophy is a required course in secondary education in France, philosophy instructors were carrying out the secular um, imperatives of uh, Republican France to get rid of religious authorities. And I argue that they also did so on the basis of neurophysiology. And you have students in the late 19th century in philosophy courses throughout the country who were among the first to learn about the ner nascent neurosciences. And it's a strong reason why Bergson was so preoccupied um, by them as well. Now, that's been my work on, on, Fran on Bergson in Republican France. What I want to do with the rest of this talk is compare that to the education policies in North Africa. The Third Republic, um, which was about eight, which was 1870 up until the Nazi occupation of, of France in the mid 20th century, um, was, was liberal, as we just discussed. It was based on, it saw itself as building the nation, as we just learned, primarily through education that served um, very instrumental goals of uh, homogenizing the French language. It's critical to remember that still in the late 19th century, France was, French was not yet the um, dominant, it was not yet the majority language of France. There were plenty, plenty of patois spoken uh, throughout the country, so linguistic instruction was key. And linguistic instruction was key, of course, in uh, French colonies in uh, North Africa as well. The most prized possession was Algeria, and that's where the most uh, developed educational program uh, was implemented under the Third Republic. And I want to suggest that that education program was very much based on a school of energy. And there was a focus on uh, the student's will, a priority of volition, what we might call volunteerism that was also shared in Bergson's thought and critical to the um, neuropsychological thrust of the curriculum that I had just discussed. Um, a typical manual that was used by instructors in uh, indigenous schools, as they were called in North Africa, makes it clear, and I'm quoting, the Arab who has been to school will identify not with what he knows, but with what he does. This focus on action, uh, I want to suggest, is not innocent. It very much is rooted in the sensory motor orientation of uh, neurology at the time. So as, as a history of the, the French in, in North Africa, Algiers was the first um, 
conquest at the beginning of the July monarchy in 1830. The period that's worth our focus is after uh, the, the Kabyle revolt, which raised most of the uh, colonial schools um, in North Africa. What you find under the Third Republic is a doubling down on efforts to assimilate um, Arab students into um, schools, language instruction being the primary uh, means of assimilation. And by the 1880s, indigenous schools were reconstructed. And in 1889, there were about 122 uh, total indigenous schools in the colony. And so that model was being then extended into other colonial possessions like Morocco in the early 20th century. The School of Energy was designed to address a specific problem of colonial administration in North Africa. And the problem uh, was this, how do we make Muslim students not just learn the French language and learn about French culture, but how do we also energize them to aspire to become French? And here we have the energy um, galvanizing the volition of uh, Arab and Kabyle students and the classroom being the primary vehicle for that galvanization. This I'm suggesting is where the philosophy of a school of energy is brought to bear on the institutions of Republican colonialism. And we can see that play out in the curricula used. Let's compare primary schools in France on the left to those in Algeria on the right. And what you find is that these are actually very similar in the first court, in the first year of the morals course, and this is what it is, um, morals being taught to primary school students, um, you find something that is very familiar to what Durkheim was talking about. You have a liberal conception of responsibilities being instructed to students here. That is in the first year, um, we have the um, the child and its family, obligations to brothers and sisters, the you're understanding your context. And then in both the colonial and metropolitan curricula being taught by instructors, we find the concentric circles of obligations expanding outward, the duties toward oneself, to family, to the school, to other people, and as we see the Algerian curriculum concluding uh, in the bottom right of the page, responsibilities to France, this being the ultimate goal. And my suggestion here is that although this is of course developed within the rubric of liberalism, we can't rely on liberalism entirely to understand the motivations for a school of energy namely that neurology and psychology were providing a um, intellectual basis, a uh, scientific justification for the emphasis on galvanizing students, uh, colonial students, fidelity to the pet tree. What it's also, what those sciences also help us understand from this era is how it is that two nearly identical curricula in mainland France and its, and its uh, colonies could be um, diverted to such widely divergent ends. In France, of course, the curriculum is designed to develop uh, subjects of the nation state, uh, I'm sorry, citizens of the nation state. And in the colonies, it is being used to um, mold subjects of the empire. And uh, the words of uh, Charles Jolnar, the governor of Algeria during the period are illuminating. The primary school that is in France, the cornerstone of the Republic, is in Algeria the foundation of our domination. Of course, during these times, colonial administrators talked more openly and explicitly about their goals. And so what I'm suggesting is that the same curriculum could um, be canalized, if you will, to different ends 
uh, thanks to the intellectual justifications provided by the human sciences at the time, namely, namely to energize students' volition in different directions. And uh, one, I think, nice uh, archival snippet that I came across was a letter written by um, an inspector general of indigenous, indigenous schools in Algeria, Eugene Scheer, in which he is writing to the French education minister and avowed uh, colonialist uh, Jules Ferry, and he's asking for magic lanterns to be incorporated into uh, indigenous schools. Magic lanterns are what we called projectors back in the day. Um, but this was new. This was huge to be able to use light to channel energy to put instruction onto a wall would thought to work not only on the intellect of students, but also to work upon their sensory motor modalities as well. Hence, we have the school of energy. And I'm going to read that uh, letter that I found. This scientific method, namely the magic lantern, uh, will be for me an excellent auxiliary to give even lecture to give lectures to the tribes. You will see not only the eyes, but also the minds of children and adults how they'll be struck. My evenings would go by agreeably and with the appropriate subjects, I would engrave morals onto the volonté, the wills of young Muslims. They so badly need these devices in the classroom. So please give us more money so we can invest them and create a better school of energy. It's just a fascinating uh, document that I came across. Um, what I, so, we really find in instances like this, uh, Bergson's philosophy of colonialism being played out. Um, there was indeed a philosophy of colonialism being used by the Third Republic, a philosophy that relied very much on the same scientific resources that Bergson did in his early works engaging with the young brain sciences but of course being diverted to much different ends in the school of the, in the, um, in the classrooms of North Africa. And one interesting figure in this story that I'm telling is uh, the architect of the curriculum in North Africa, Charles Jean Mar. He was a fellow uh, student at the Ecole Normale Supérieure uh, just slightly before Bergson. He was a, a philosophy agrégé in 1875. And he was very attuned to the same uh, research in neurology and psychology that um, Bergson was. In 1882, he published his dissertation, The Idea of Personality in Modern Psychology. And he wrote in his guidebook for colonial instructors in primary school classrooms, especially those teaching the morals courses about duties to the French nation. I'm quoting now, at school, instruction is only a means. Education alone scores only one goal. It takes as its objective the intelligence that it lights up, but it's also addressed to the heart and to the will. To the heart in order to raise it to affectionate and disinterested sentiments, to the will in order to strengthen it and direct it toward that liberal notion, duty. The Arab who has been to school identifies not with what he knows, but with what he does. And again, we find this emphasis on volition in the, um, in the instruction manuals. And I wanna suggest that that resonates with the dualist metaphysics of Bergson throughout his early corpus that is very much interested in negotiating the relationship between intellection and action, that is our spiritual and sensory motor materiality. And we find this same duality being um, used to support colonial projects in the Third Republic. Now, one reason why this was used, like why, why else would you want to implement these sciences um, were, were, there were practical problems to address because um, filling seats was a persistent challenge in colonial schools. Parents resisted what they saw as alien schools um, vitiating their own Islamic traditions and colonial educators therefore confronted the problem of how do we attract students to the classroom. 
few families were willing to release their children from household or agricultural work. And those parents who did generally preferred um, Quranic schools or kutubas, um, I'm sorry, I'm kutubs uh, in North Africa. And those existed alongside indigenous schools. And the further problem was um, when so many kids are doing uh, manual labor around the home, they don't have the chance to go to school until they're 10 or 11 in France promoting linguistic assimilation, wants to get them in the classroom as early um, as possible. And so here you have colonial administrators and educational directors asking, how do we get students to act the fam? How do we motivate the families to propel them into the classroom? And Charles Jean Maire, the, uh, who I was just mentioning, tackled this ch challenge when he arrived in Algeria to take over the um, university system there. And he suggested that it was critical to incorporate Islamic practices into the morals courses, that French indigenous schools could not be secular or um, laic as they were in the metropole, that they had to um, use Quranic sources in order to draw in students. And we have here um, an extended quotation that France asks of its primary school teachers, French or indigenous, to show the greatest respect for the beliefs of students and their parents, to abstain scrupulously from the smallest criticism with regard to the doctrines of the Quran. Instructors would be mistaken if they imagined that by boasting irreligion, as was the case in the metropole, they would answer to the administration's intentions or to please it alone. Such zeal, perhaps inspired by laudable sentiments, would still be maladroit and sometimes even shameful. And he goes on, in order to bring about a beneficial and effective effect in the classroom, that is, instructors must play to the trust of their co-religionaires. They will be lost if they don't recite the uh, formula, by which it means, of course, the shahida, and if they do not go without alcoholic drinks, and if they don't constrain themselves during Ramadan. Those, however, who do respect the prescriptions of the Quran will have an incontestable authority to speak in the name of France, to speak morals. And so what you find is that uh, metropolitan France is sending uh, philosophy agrégés into the provinces in order to extend the French language, in order to extend secularism, uh, root out clerical instruction. And Bergson was one of the professors who performed this uh, duty as a public servants, yet in the colonies, religious tools are being incorporated into indigenous schools in order to make for a more effective school of energy. And I'm suggesting that one of the ways in which we can understand this uh, paradox within French liberalism at the time is to look to the um, human sciences that provided justification for a conception of the will that could be molded differently between the metropole and the colony. And I'd be interested to hear what other people um, think about that. It's a conception of the will that we find uh, throughout Bergson, one that is uh, plastic, that could be molded to different ends. And I hope to have illuminated a new end toward which it was directed, not simply by Bergson, but within the institutions where he worked. Um, I, I also want to remind us that this wasn't the only um, blemish on Bergson's record, the extended quotation that I began with in which he praised the philosophy of colonialism found in the School of Energy. Uh, I've published a number of articles on Bergson's career as a diplomat um, from World War I uh, up to his time in the uh, League of Nations. And in 1917, he was uh, sent on a trip to persuade President Woodrow Wilson, a trip to America to persuade the president to enter uh, the First World War. And he was there with the prime uh, ministers, Rene Viviani and um, former prime minister, Alexandre Ribot. And Bergson's role was as an intellectual ambassador there to woo America's uh, intellectual president. He had a PhD after all, and convince 
uh, America to side with the French. And there's an interesting uh, anecdote in, Soule, in Philippe Soule's book, Bergson Politique, in which uh, Senator Al Albert um, Beveridge recounts an encounter with um, Bergson in Washington, DC. And Bergson is arguing that the German psyche, uh, the German notions of Kultur, are fundamentally incompatible with um, international pluralism of the sort that Woodrow Wilson espoused. And I'm quoting now, they, the Germans, are so engrossed in their idea of the superiority of German Kultur, this is Bergson uttering to the Senator, that they do not recognize the great truths that other nations with their different cultures have a right to exist. We French, on the contrary, believe that when any people have developed into a nation, they have proved their, their right to a separate existence and that the thought, the ideal, the culture of that nation is thus developed in a contribution to the sum of human welfare. And Beveridge quickly uh, retorts and he, he says, well, wait a minute, haven't you done the same in the case of your colonial uh, possessions, namely Algeria and Morocco and the rest? And Berg's res Bergson's response is, I'm quoting, it cannot be said that these were nations. They were warring tribes. They had no solidarity, no national consciousness. Perhaps we might go a step further. They had their will wasn't sufficiently energized so as to cohere as a uh, as a national body of the sort that a state would represent in a nation state. So, um, what does this mean? Are we supposed to hate Bergson now? I don't want to suggest that as all, as that at all. I'm a uh, most of my scholarship is historical. I want to understand the um, institutions, resources, and community that um, make philosophical problems get up off the ground and give them meaning. And I want to suggest that um, this context of the French Empire really helps us understand that Bergson's thought is not just um, floating in a rarefied milieu of other great thinkers, but very much rooted in a specific moment of time and that the sources on which he drew in neurology and psychology were themselves very much uh, enmeshed, not just with laboratory work or philosophical debate, but the ends of empire building as well. Thank you very much. Emil, you're, mute, you're muted, Emil. Okay, excuse me. Okay, I thank the I thanks Larry and Alex for their presentation, and now I have on my list uh, Izashi, who need to ask a question to to Alex. Yeah, thank you very you much. You have the floor. Yeah, and so. Uh, I added, uh, I added, uh, ador, adored uh, you much your talk uh, because I myself am interested to dig uh, further the possibility of uh, re-evaluating the Bergsonian political philosophy. And um, if I understand well your talk, uh, it was in the prolongation, uh, in the continuation of your general project. Uh, detailed, uh, developed in your book, uh, Human Rights uh, as a Way of Life. So, this one. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, I'm no, uh, wondering. Yes, <laughs> and then uh, I'm wondering so, uh, what will be the, how to say, the main uh, difference and tr transition between uh, two uh, elements? the human rights and the liberalism. Uh, because uh, in your previous book, uh, you accentuated uh, human rights as a medium of uh, personal transformation and uh, self-care to initiate all human beings uh, into love and uh, perhaps, in, in, uh, and of course, into action. But, and then uh, for, I think for liberalism, I think the, the uh, point is rather uh, uh, accentuated on the, for example, protection of uh, uh, individual liberty um, uh, or the protection 
for the pro protection, I think. So, um, or the liberation. So, and then uh, how, uh, what, what is uh, the, the point uh, of accentuation is uh, different now, uh, transition for, from uh, human rights to liberation. So it is my question. Uh, no, that's a great question. Um, no, I, so I haven't, you're right, I haven't it's exactly escaped the orbit of that book on, um, on Bergson. Um, I don't think there, so the short version, I suppose, was, um, first of all, as I, the way I concluded my thought, I think it's very interesting. So in that text, I didn't talk much about democracy and it was really, it's a self-help book essentially. And what I found so interesting about Bergson's reflections on um, liberalism is how it is so untimely with respect to democracy. And it's a much more political vision as to what it means to be um, duty bound and generous and civic minded in a way that I think the material on human rights just jumps right away to love. But the liberalism aspect has much more embeddedness within particular problems within um, uh, it's a much more composite phenomenon, let me put it that way, um, in that it's negotiating with uh, tendencies of, of, uh, of, of the closed society, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that would be the main answer. But as I said, so this isn't really a, a book on Bergson, and I'm not going to really use Bergson. I just find that Bergson is really helpful to recover this intuition that liberalism might be more than rules and procedures, and that there's something that might be very um, vital about it and uh, to reinvigorate our commitment. So in that sense, I'm looking for Bergson more as a, as, a, as a cheerleader for a general intuition rather than any specific point. But your question's great, and I'd have to reflect more on yeah. the specific uh, contribution. Yeah, uh, could I uh, add uh, a little bit? Um, uh, for, uh, how, how to say? Um, for Bergsonian uh, political philosophy, the great problem is uh, how to say his uh, political philosophy is, uh, I think, uh, what I call uh, proto-political -philo proto philosophy. It's, okay. uh, he, he doesn't talk uh, precisely on the political, but he uh, tries to go beyond the political. This is why the, the title is uh, uh, Two Sources. It's, it's not on the morality and on the religion, but it's, it's on the uh, origin. Uh, in the sources of uh, or morality and uh, uh, religion. And this is why it's uh, uh, rather proto-political uh, than uh, uh, political. And, and this is why you, you said uh, for the uh, uh, liberalism, uh, he, he, he can go to uh, the uh, more detailed problems, more precise problems, but his general attitude, his, his general uh, movement uh, of thought is to go uh, rather to the, how to say, um, to go beyond, not to go on uh, uh, attacking uh, the, the precise uh, separate Programs. So I, I, I think uh, perhaps uh, uh, could you uh, explain more uh, this, uh, how to say, um, to movement in, inverse, I think. In no, I think so, uh, I have nothing to say but whole, wholehearted agreement with what you said. So I guess what I, now that you're fleshing it out, I guess what I would like to see in, um, uh, in exploring the liberalism stuff is Bergson not going, is not going extra or pre-political right away, but somehow dwelling a little bit more at that level. Um, it's very interesting. So for example, I was talking with, uh, as I do with Melanie about laughter. It's not a text I work with very much, but she focused on laughter really because she thought that it was the moment in Bergson's uh, when he really, in, in, in his ethical uh, work, when he really sticks with the composite, when he's not trying to carve up between uh, pure tendencies and locating them, but trying to see how we are in this kind of embedded phenomenon. And I suppose that 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 sense of, of Bergson trying to not leap out of um, the, the composite mess that we live in is what, it, you have to look for those moments in his work. I think laughter, Melanie's made me appreciate that, but now also on your reflections on liberalism, that might be a place where Bergson is holding his horses as it were, and to investigate that moment. So yeah, so thank you. I just, I agree with your question and it's, it's direction completely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Alia, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, 
Thank you both uh, so much. That was a really amazing session. So, um, and I have questions for both of you and I will try to be brief. So um, for Alex, I guess my main question is, I understand the project that you're doing and why Berkson would fit into this. Um, and I am interested in the sentimentalism that would be needed for liberalism. So I, I agree with that, but I'm not what, a thinker who's really inclined to be, um, uh, uh, sort of um, in favor of liberalism immediately because I actually see it as as having those exclusions ingrained in the very structure that it has. So I'm wondering whether uh, the same, whether Berkson might also lend himself in the two sources, especially in the question of openness, to the to being um, to someone who's beyond liberalism. So it seems like you know, someone else could argue, well, this is actually um, a critique that would take us to a different kind of, um, um, if, it, if we're gonna call it political, but a different kind of political, definitely realm that would get rid of some of, many of those sort of distinctions and exclusions that liberalism seems to have structurally embedded within it. Um, so, so that's just the, I mean, I understand why you're doing your, but I, yeah, it's, it's a, I think there might be a choice there, right? So, okay, and Larry, yes. Okay, that was amazing. I really, really uh, am interested in all these sources and I'd love to just go through and, and take a look at the, and I've read the, the, the various places that you discussed, so the nations versus tribes and obviously the Ecole d'Energie um, and worked on them. But I wonder, I have some, I have a really, the neurophysiology you don't mention l'école d'Alger and in psychiatry. And I'm wondering, that's at the same time um, as some of Berkson's works, definitely prior to the two sources. And so um, is there, have you found any links there that he might have read uh, Paul or any of the, because the work on the brain and all of the, the other stuff would indicate that in fact, the sense, if he's working on the sensory motor system, then there's a there's something there that will bring right that link is important because the their neurological accounts are important for arguing for the uh, naturalized uh, sort of indolence right of the Muslim so the, there's something um, uh, built into the brain structures and into the uh, psychology and so I'm wondering about that if there, if you found a link there or if that's something to explore. Um, and then the other thing was just, so, sorry, quickly, two things. I have a lot of things, but maybe we can talk separately afterwards. But um, the, the education systems don't seem to actually be in parallel when I was reading them in your slide, uh, specifically because of this emphasis on uh, historiette in the first year of education for the indigenous children, um, which is supposed to, I take it, teach them through sort of anecdote and um, example, how to get rid of some of the habits that they have as indigenous children. So there's a kind of undoing that has to happen before they can go on to the second year where they would learn about like alliance, uh, allegiance to France. And there's also no uh, devoir vers uh, Dieu in the indigenous. So there's several things that don't quite, there's things that go together, but I, would be interested in the differences as well, because if what is going on is this sort of simulation of religion on the part of the Instituto, which is remarkably interesting, I've never heard of that. So that's actually just really interesting. So the Instituto needs to simulate Islam, which is just bizarre, because if you say the uh, Shahada, then you become Muslim. So it's just kind of a weird, um, insults really it's kind of it's just a bizarre uh, way of doing it but if that's the the point then the point is to sort of undo and redo certain habits and affections and the question of the heart and the will um, that would then bring the children back into um, a way of like turning them around and assimilating their will and so you go the the direction that the will already has but then turn it in another direction which actually does sound Berksonian so um, so I just Sorry, that was a for, for a number of points, but yeah, a lot of things to think about. Thank you both so much. Uh, Larry, you want to go first? Sure, great. Thanks so much. As for uh, L'Ecole d'Alger, 
I'll pursue it and explore it. Really appreciate the suggestion. Um, there's absolutely not an identity between the two uh, curricula for morals and key differences uh, deserve to be brought to our attention. And thanks for doing so. As for the stories that a indigenous school teacher would have to teach, they aren't there in the curriculum, which is why the instructor has to play anthropologist as it were, and go on reconnaissance in the col colony and uncover some, whereas those stories are available off the shelf in metropolitan uh, schools for the first year. Both morals courses follow a two year track along the uh, similar um, period in the student's life. The fact that the second year in indigenous school does not include responsibilities toward God uh, is absolutely very interesting. And it's perhaps that absence which makes the recitation of the Shahida even more absurd and paradoxical apropos um, your point. That's a nice little um, interpretive wrinkle that I think could be folded into um, folded into the story. So thanks a lot for your remarks. Okay. Uh, thanks. I, um, I just want to say too, thanks to, uh, I think it's Katarina that designed the program or Lynn, but uh, this is cool to put to pair us together. We both went to, Alia, was it you? Anyways, yeah, it was. It, it, anywho, great match. Uh, Larry and I both trained at the same. We're in the program. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, the four of us <laughs> with Said okay. and Dalia and, and Len. Uh, anyways, it's a nice fit. Uh, Larry and I both trained at the same place at uh, Hopkins, just at slightly different times. Uh, we're not Normalien, but we're Jones Hopkins. I, I don't know how you would say that. So that's kind of cool. Um, uh, yeah. So Elliot, I completely agree with the kind of um, direction of your question. Um, very much, and I think Bergson would, in a sense, agree because he's saying, "Look, I'm, at the very simplest level, he's saying to he's saying to Durkheim, like, look, Emil, if you want to produce liberal individuals, your way is not going to work. You're going to make liberals who are really liberal to one another, but the moment push comes to shove to any of your interests outside your group, you're going to turn deeply illiberal at the drop of a hat, and you're going to lie about it all the time. And so, what he's saying is, look, if we take on the classical qualities or characteristics of what it means to be a liberal subject." For Bergson, it means becoming open in his way. And so I guess it would mean, in your terms, pushing beyond liberalism. But for Bergson, it would just be recovering what liberalism or uh, being liberal means. And so indulge me for one moment. But in the book I'm writing right now, a key concept that I'm taking is Kierkegaard's idea of Christendom. And Kierkegaard's uh, thing is that everyone in Copenhagen thinks they're good Christians, but really they think about it for about 10 minutes on Sunday and then clock out. And what I want to say is that we live in liberaldom. Namely, that we have the same sort of relationship to that. Like, we think we're good liberal subjects, but if we were to pursue what it means to be liberal, um, our lives would change. So, like, someone like Rawls, uh, you think of him as, like, a stuffy philosopher or whatever he is. But if we were to live our life for one moment according to the original position where we forget our positionality for a sec and try to reason with one another morally, or if we organize ourselves according to the difference principle in which inequalities would be justified only if they benefit the least advantage of society, everything would change, society would change, we would change in our, in our bones. And so what I'm trying to do in the book is say, look, <laughs> with the collapse of Christianity, there's a big market for self-help. Uh, Jordan Peterson and Alain de Botton on their own can't fill it. And uh, so you can go reach for whatever traditions you want. You can go to Stoicism, you can go to some Arabic diet, fine, do it. But what I'm saying is that if you just double down on liberalism and, and really commit to that, that's as good of a way of life as you're going to find anywhere else. You just have to be serious about it. And so that's what I think Bergson is doing, is being serious about being liberal. That's what I think Rawls is doing. And I think it just, it's really good uh, politically and spiritually for that to happen. Okay. Thank you. Katrina, please. Yes, very quickly. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you also for the questions, Alia, and uh, it's really a very beautiful session, I think. And I want to thank Larry for facing this, this issue, because I think after many works on First World War and this uh, topic of colonialism is really worth uh, being faced in Bergsonian studies. And I think next uh, Friday we'll, we'll have the chance to, to face it more. Um, but I, I had a, a question actually for Alexander um, about your use of the um, category of liberalism for both uh, Durkheim and Bergson. Uh, because actually, 
uh, of course, uh, Buchanan, I was, <laughs> I've never considered him a, a liberal, actually. And um, I was wondering how would you, how would you uh, integrate in your reading uh, his uh, idea of obligation and his evaluation of uh, uh, anomie, of social anomie, I think, especially of the critiques that he gives to Jean-Marie Guyot and his moral with no obligation and, or sanction. And at the same time, uh, I'm, I'm wondering how would you um, consider the last the chapter of the two sources where Bergson uh, suggests also uh, some economic regulation, uh, the regulation of birds. Uh, I mean, it's a, a, a big tension actually between the, the individual and the society in the, uh, <laughs> in the political and ethical uh, solutions that he gives not only uh, technical solutions, but it is always in in a dialogue with the mystics. So that's a, that's a problematic uh, uh, tension, I think. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, briefly, yeah. So I mean, the, the idea of liberalism is just so difficult because we have so many anachronistic and geographical meanings for it. So in France, it means basically small government. In the U.S., it means essentially tax and spend, big big government. Like you just got everything. And so what's interesting about trying to recover uh, the idea of liberalism as it was being used in this time is that I think, it, I think Durkheim would be sort of the prototypical liberal insofar as he precisely emphasizes duties so much. And that's what it meant to be a uh, liberal in that time. It wasn't a rights first attitude. It was a duty and obligation first attitude, uh, civic contribution, how to be a good citizen. So there was absolutely the, the kind of Anglo-American, maybe this isn't your idea, but in my little world, there's a, this opposition between liberalism on the one hand and then Republican critics of it. That just doesn't make sense at this time at all. That's not a distinction that would make sense, certainly to a thinker like Durkheim. Um, with respect, so, uh, so yes, so that's how I would read him. And precisely, I mean, liberals were exactly freaked out about things like enemy and individualism and egoism, because that's, the, that's what they thought the Times was pushing people towards. And then that's why they would be so very susceptible to seduction by socialism and other doctrines that would uh, that would be di deeply disruptive for them. So that was the so I would read Durkheim in that light. Um, let me think more about the second part of your question and the tensions that you're raising in part four. I don't have a ready-made answer, but it's really helpful to think about. So thank you. I'm just going to thank you for that, and uh, I'll I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your answer. Suzanne? Uh, hi, the floor, I loved, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I love both these papers, um, so thank you. And I don't have really well-formulated questions, but sort of a comment. And for Alex, um, it seems to me that you may, you're not giving someone like De Stahl her due <laughs> or her importance and, and the, the complications that that introduces into a certain notion of liberalism. And, and it relates to the question of energy, actually, because for de Stahl, uh, there's a response to a kind of extreme rationalism uh, that was uh, authoritative during the French Revolution, right? And that the project is to construct a public all right, so that enthusiasm and, a certain, and, and eloquence and, and being a writer instead of a philosophe, I mean, really constructing a notion of the writer in a certain way in, in order to generate a public. And from the very start for her, sort of securing institutional viability for certain uh, egalité, fraternité and so forth was, was really important against the pressures of a thoroughly uh, reactionary royalist uh, forces. So that that that's one thing, and and it, in a way, it leads to my question to to Larry uh, as well, which is that I, I think that whole question of well, the the looking at the parallels and the differences on the educational uh, curricula is fascinating in the colonial context and in the Third Republic. Um, but what I would want to recall is that the Third Republic was also an empire. <laughs> um, that, and, and so if you remember that at that point, Victor Hugo leaves for 20 years um, because he wasn't going to accept the imperial, uh, the coup d'etat of, of uh, 
Napoleon III and that establishes the Second Empire, which is, which is different, uh, considerably different from the issues and, and of, of the 1830s. Um, and so the question of sort of uh, paresse and uh, needing an infusion of, of energy and, and strength was also um, a concern for the French education system in France. They changed the curriculum to require, for example, after because of the humiliations of the Franco-Prussian War. The idea is that the, the French were too sophisticated and too whatever, and they didn't have the grit uh, that was that was necessary. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that you could consider that there are subject formations and 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 interpolations uh, uh, both within France. I mean. Even if you go back earlier, Napoleon is kind of rehearsing his takeover of the French uh, and to become emperor uh, by going off to Egypt and figuring out how to know everything and taking all of his savants and measuring everything and gaining knowledge in a colonial context. And he brings it back to create an empire in France, which is when Madame de Staël has to begin to, to struggle with him. Um, so, on the one hand, there's that appeal to the, this energy factor. I think it's ideologically very multifaceted, um, for one thing. And then on the other hand, you have this long rationalist tradition that some of the neurological uh, scientific material is supporting, right? So you have, you have, um, a notion of French rationalism, French clarity, French lucidity, and so forth. And, and that gets easily worked together with a kind of mechanistic psychology or the inheritance of Fechner and, and people like that. So this, the story is, it's fascinating. And I think it's in, incredibly complicated. On the one hand, the, maybe a mirroring of colonial empire and constituting empire <laughs> within France. Um, and on the other hand, these, these tensions between uh, uh, the, again, it goes back to the mechanistic vitalist uh, 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 issues that we were talking about this morning. Um, and the, I think I just would throw out that sometimes the valences of those things switch because in addition to all of those pieces of the story, you have the inheritance of, of Kantian ethics in the 19th century, which and is, is tied on the one hand to issues of um, skepticism after the critique of pure reason and then Kant kind of accepted within the French context as the philosopher of ethics, but that, that issue of will then takes on a different value. Then it's a question of energizing the will to be able to have that kind of universal moral law. So then maybe connecting back to Durkheim in that way, you'd have yet another, <laughs> yet another wrinkle. So I'm sorry to go on about it so much, but I wonder if you have some thoughts about the relation of colonial empire and uh, empire within the, within the nation. Um, Ray, speak, start, yeah, go out. You know what, I'm gonna go, go, thank you, Suzanne. I think the recommendation to think more about the style is totally correct, particularly with the rationalism and institutionalism. I'll just stop there, but you're totally correct. So let me just uh, take that on board and thank you, Larry. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. That's a really uh, generous number of contexts in which to think about uh, philosophies of the will of the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, the suggestion of mine is that, the, that neurophysiology is being directed in the colonies to mold subjects and in the metropole to mold citizens. And so what we have is two different kinds of subjectivities being constructed. Neither are given to be sure. And there's absolutely an internal colonization taking place. Uh, Eugene Weber's work on um, making modern France and the emphasis that was where I was influenced to talk about uh, linguistic assimilation within France to root out patois that you find in the provinces and deploy a homogenized Gallic culture is certainly one goal of 
uh, Republican education that Bergson was at the forefront of teaching in his career as a lycée instructor. And that lycée curriculum across all of the courses, uh, not just philosophy, did draw on the sources that you've mentioned. And as a historian of the human sciences and someone who's engaged uh, most closely with uh, neurology and psychology and Bergson's engagement uh, with those two nascent sciences, that's the reason for my focus on them. But I take your invitation to explore other um, concepts of energy that were um, at play during this era. And I guess also that uh, the, the, the citizen can be as ideological <laughs> and as oppressive. Constructing the citizen can be as deforming as constructing, maybe not in the same way, obviously, but I'm just saying one can- um, There's a violence in, there, yeah. Yeah, one can fall into some kind of a radical distinction between the evils over here compared to there, but there is also maybe much closer in, in its kind of ideological construction and ideological violence. Um, uh, certainly during the Second Empire, <laughs> again, after the First World War in, in France, where being a citizen was completely shut down all idea of kind of social reform in, in France around the First World War, right? So, so the, the difficult thing for us to think about, I think, is that w we tend to think of the uh, a kind of a glorified notion of liberalism, perhaps, or of, of the democratic in a certain way, whereas in the French context, it was the Third Republic and, and, and Luc Ferré and those people that were both, both constructing the educational system as the great ideological subject formation, forming institution, and also advocating, uh, advocating colonial, the colonial project as a way of kind of shoring up the authority of the Republic after the defeat with Germany. So. Thank you.